Hello everybody, welcome back to Mega Projects. This time we're doing a historical one. We're jumping all the way back to ancient Rome to cover their sanitation system because, well, why else would you come to Mega Projects except to learn about shit? So uh, here we go. <laughs> There could be few ancient cities that have captured the imagination like Rome. The vast, imposing Colosseum with its bloody gladiatorial battles, or the refined elegance of the Pantheon, which even today remains the largest freestanding dome in the world. One aspect of ancient Rome often overlooked was its extraordinary sanitation system. Great aqueducts transported fresh spring water for miles into the thirsty city as underwater tunnels carried the dirty water out. If you found yourself caught short, you could always stop at a public toilet to do your business. To put that in perspective, London didn't open its first official public toilet until 1852, over 1,300 years after the fall of Rome. I'm not sure this is a good thing. Public toilets in general? <laughs> Somewhere I really try to avoid. <laughs> I know sanitation systems sound about as fun as watching paint dry because I mean, we've covered space stations and canals and crazy stuff like this on this channel, so uh sanitation systems, but it's going to be interesting, I promise. There was nowhere on earth quite like Rome when it came to sanitation. Wherever you're watching this video, the chances are that your ancestors from 2,000 years ago had the kind of sanitary behavior that we in the modern world would find, let's just say, appalling. Even if we go back 100 or 200 years, we'd be horrified at the kind of sanitation that our ancestors used daily. But one city, in particular, was very different. At its peak, Rome was a glorious city that oversaw the largest empire of the ancient world. A city of unimaginable wealth. But with this, as you can imagine, came a sense of entitlement. Romans demanded the very best, and while the empire was still booming, emperors and senators were all too happy to oblige. Wait, didn't they wipe their butts with a sponge on a stick? The very best! This was a city that paved the way for modern sanitation. The first to use piping embedded in concrete. The first to make a conscious effort at separating poor quality water used for latrines and bathhouses and cleaner water to be used for drinking and cooking. And in the Cloaca Maxima, they had the most astonishing of ancient sewer systems. Yes, life in ancient Rome would have been very different than almost anywhere else on the planet. But as their influence spread, so did their ideas of sanitation and cleanliness. Like, oh no, we're being invaded by the Romans, but at least they're bringing good toilets, guys. However, the fall of Rome heralded in a darkness that would take Europe nearly a thousand years to emerge from. Unbelievably, some of the techniques used in Rome would not be replicated in major European capitals until the 19th century. While Rome may have had the most impressive sanitation system in the ancient world, many particular aspects certainly were not new. Mesopotamia had the world's first clay pipes as early as 4000 BC, while China, Greece, and Egypt all had notable systems, though almost always on a considerably smaller scale than what was seen in Rome. Much of what came before was confined either to religious buildings or those of the very rich. Those at the bottom of society, and even those midway, would not have access to ancient sanitation, except perhaps to use communal wells. The first real example of urban sanitation might be a little surprising. The ancient city of Harappa, located in Punjab, Pakistan, was at its largest between 2600 BC and 1900 BC, with as many as 24,000 inhabitants. This is perhaps the earliest example of individual houses connected to a basic form of a sewer. Many houses seemed to have what was probably a washroom with a small drain that directed water out into the streets. This region has thrown up some wonderful finds if you find sanitation interesting, including drainage channels, street ducts, and complex systems to harvest rainwater. It, <laughs> I gotta say, it does sound pretty interesting. The Indus civilization came to an end around 1300 BC, still a good thousand years before Rome was a city to be reckoned with. The Romans might have been good, but they certainly did their homework. The 
rise and eventual fall of Rome was roughly a thousand years, beginning sometime in the 6th century BC and ending in 476 AD as the barbarian horde descended onto the city. It was an astonishing time that saw human ingenuity jump forward. Whether it was military tactics, construction, or indeed sanitation, the Romans set themselves apart. From North Africa to the Scottish borderlands, Rome dominated much of Europe. But it was an empire that became so big, it simply contracted in on itself. Yet Rome at its pinnacle must have been a sight to behold, but not always exactly how you imagine it. While the sanitation system in Rome was well ahead of its time, it doesn't necessarily mean cleanliness was too. The streets of Rome would have been littered with old food, waste, dead animals, and the city still suffered from outbreaks of diseases, just like everywhere else. The Romans were particularly focused on the dangers of standing water, an idea like many of theirs which originated from ancient Greece. While the streets may have been filthy in some areas, as long as the water wasn't congealing in public, they seemed satisfied. Modern doctors would, of course, have a thing or two to say about this, but at the time, this was cutting-edge thinking. We can't really blame them. They didn't know about germs. <laughs> There's this saying that Rome wasn't built in a day, and that, of course, is true, and neither was its sanitation system. At its peak, it's thought that Rome may have even hit a million inhabitants, and its sanitation system, and indeed much of the city, was carefully improved upon for hundreds of years as the city expanded. Ask anybody what was the most impressive construction achievement in ancient Rome, and it's unlikely that many people will say, oh, it's the Cloaca Maxima. But even its name, the Greatest Sewer, should give us an indication of just how important it was. Yes, it will never rival Rome's more flamboyant construction projects, but it certainly deserves to be mentioned alongside the Colosseum and the Pantheon. Originally built to drain the marshes from nearby lands around 600 BC, it eventually went on to form the basis of the world's first large-scale sewage system. And guess what? It wasn't even built by the Romans. No, we have the late Etruscan kings to thank for the Cloaca Maxima. These were ancient people who lived in an area between Tuscany and Campania, including what is today modern Rome. The Cloaca Maxima began as an open channel that was constructed by lining an existing riverbed with stones, an act that raised the entire channel as much as 9 meters 30 feet above ground. It was originally designed to carry away stormwater from the Forum district, which was once around 6 meters 20 feet below sea level, but it would eventually be connected to latrines and bathhouses throughout Rome. In total, it runs nearly 310 meters, a little over 1,000 feet, and measures 6 meters or 20 feet wide. Think of it as a large-scale drain that collects from various sub-channels before funneling it out into the river. Once the Romans had moved in, a decision was made to cover the tunnels, probably for both aesthetic and hygiene purposes. There's just something about watching human feces float through a city that doesn't exactly call out refinement. But also remember this was a blossoming city, and the land was scarce, especially in central Rome. Over time, the Cloaca Maxima was bricked over, which may or may not be why we seldom hear about it. Buildings were then constructed over the top. But but it still remains this vital cog in Rome's sanitation system. Amazingly, this early sewer system is still in operation today. In the late 20th century, the decision was taken to connect the modern system to it, and just like that, a channel dug over 2,500 years ago got a new lease of life. Of course, Rome has its modern system that connects to people's houses, but the Cloaca Maxima still deposits excess water out into the river Tiber. So the Romans seem to have mastered getting rid of water, but what about bringing it in? The Romans are known for their aqueducts, and nowhere were these great stone water canals more prominent than in ancient Rome. A total of 11 aqueducts were constructed that brought water into the city for a wide variety of purposes. The first of these, the Aqua Appia, was started and finished in 312 BC and ran about 10 miles 16.5 kilometers. The final was the Aqua Alexandria, built in 226 AD, running 14 miles 22.4 kilometers. When we think of aqueducts today, we picture raised canals with great stone arches, but much of Rome's aqueducts actually ran underground. The total 
or combined length of all 11 from source to city came to nearly 500 miles that's 800 kilometers an extraordinary achievement in the ancient world as i mentioned briefly earlier water coming into the city was designated between two categories the best quality water would be used for drinking and cooking while the worst was used for latrines sewers and somewhat worryingly public baths ew in total, they brought 1.127 million cubic meters, nearly 300 million gallons of water, into Rome each day, mostly from the Anio and the Apennine Mountains. The most visually impressive of Rome's aqueducts is still visible today, and it's the Aqua Claudia. Built between 38 AD and 52 AD, this vast waterway measures some 43 miles, 69 kilometers, with much of it underground. It brought about 190,000 cubic meters, 6. 7 million cubic feet in in 24 hours which is about 2.3 cubic meters per second and this stretched from the hill region to the east of rome and right into the center of the city quite simply rome could never have grown to its peak size without these life-giving arteries that stretched throughout the city While in many parts of the world people were more than happy to crouch and do their business in a hole in the ground, the Romans were a little bit above it at this point. Of course, the rich had toilets in their villas, but for the everyday man, woman, and child, the public latrines were an everyday occurrence. Now, let's just shatter the myth here a little bit. Now, if you've got at all in your mind of Roman public toilets being these clean places where people sat next to each other and talked about the day's events, well, just no. In reality, they weren't like this. They were dark and smelly places. No surprise there that you would assume Romans wanted to get out of as quickly as possible. Research done on the waste found near Roman latrines shows high levels of disease comparable to other places around the same time. It may have looked better than what was happening in many other parts of the world, but it would have still horrified any modern human. These public toilets were typically multi-seater affairs with 8 to 20 seats facing inwards. A gutter below would then transport the waste out of the toilet and eventually into the cloaca maxima just sounds like a bad time personal anecdote i was once on a trip in china on a bus and i stopped at the place where we we're going to use the toilet and it was a communal place where people went to take a shit i just left <laughs> it's like i'm gonna hold it now toilet paper was of course a good 2000 years off at this point instead the romans wiped using a sea sponge attached to a stick known as a tersorium told you this was then washed in a bucket containing water and salt or vinegar now i use the word wash very liberally here in fact some people found it so nasty they carried around their own sponge on a stick while the rich had their own toilets, they were not always so eager to connect it to the wider system. If you had a large villa with plenty of money, you certainly weren't cleaning out your own toilet. There were servants or even slaves to do that kind of thing for you. But there was also a very real fear involved. The Romans seemed to have a fixation on the idea of creatures climbing out of the sewer and into their homes. Whether it was rats or, rather bizarrely, according to one Roman tale, an octopus, citizens of Rome were often reluctant to connect their homes of the vast sewer system at least early on it's like surely you'd get over that like downside well all of the uh the, the poo and stuff is building up in the garden but at least we don't have octopuses coming into the house <laughs> Another thing we commonly associate with ancient Rome was public bathing. Again, the reality was very different from what we imagine today. Recent evidence has revealed just how disease-ridden the Roman baths actually were. Public baths could be divided into two. The thermes, which were large public bathing houses, and balneas, which were smaller facilities, sometimes in private hands. Public baths were often places of grand opulence. The first example, dating from 19 BC, was a circle area, 25 meters, 82 feet across, and complete with a garden and an artificial river. The largest of all of Rome's bathhouses, the Baths of Diocletian, was simply enormous and could accommodate 3,000 bathers. It also came complete with a library, games room, as well as the standard sauna, steam room, and cold water bathing area. In total, the area covered around 32 acres of land, a huge size for its central location. The water used was brought in from the aqueducts, and depending on what room it was used in, would either be cooled or heated. A hypercost was an early form of central heating and typically lay below certain areas of the building. The ceiling of the room was raised on stone pillars with a furnace below it, kept at a roaring temperature. 
The heat was then distributed around the building through flues, pipes made of clay or tile, and used to heat the water in the bathhouse to an agreeable temperature. The system was also used for general purposes, though because of its cost, only the very rich would have it. As I've said, these were not particularly clean places, but if anything, they were more about social interaction rather than maintaining health. These were essentially early community centers where you could go, work out a little in the gym, read a book, and then take a bath and catch up with your friends. It sounds charming if you don't think too much about the horrible disease. To get an idea of just how far ahead ancient Rome was in terms of sanitation, you need only look at what came next when the Roman Empire had fallen. Though the very rich would have access to better services, it wasn't until the late 19th century that cities around the continents began to even resemble what was once ancient Rome in terms of sanitary ideas. It was only after a water pipe was directly linked to a deadly cholera outbreak in London in the mid-19th century that the city began implementing a large-scale sewer system. Now, it's easy to nitpick about sanitary conditions in ancient Rome. It has become slightly fashionable to debunk the notion that Rome was a clean place. And no, it certainly wasn't perfect, mainly because there was just so much they still didn't know, and just because you lived in Rome it didn't mean you were any less likely to get the plague. But this vast system that was constructed over 2,000 years ago was able to sustain the largest, most significant city that the world had ever known. It was so far ahead of its time that it's almost difficult to fathom. The Romans were fond of one phrase in particular, all roads lead to Rome. While we think of ourselves as the embodiment of modern sanitary practices, the road to modern sanitation stretches all the way back to the Eternal City. So that was Rome's sanitation system, and I'm glad we got to mention the sponge on a stick, because I feel that comes up all the time. Any video about Rome, and you're not mentioning the sponge on a stick, something's gone wrong. And so, there we have it. A interesting, an old mega project. As I always say at the end, if you've got a suggestion, it doesn't have to be old. It can be modern. It can be, we've even covered a Dyson Sphere, which is like a theoretical future mega project. If you've got an interesting suggestion, please do leave it in the comments below. Thumbs up the ones you like. Also, thumbs up this video. Why not subscribe to this channel? Also, why not? And I'll see you next time.